Um, but I know we have room for improvement. And that's also why I believe we're here today. I wanted to take a moment uh, to truly listen. Uh, and I really wanted to invite Oklahomans to join me in listening. Uh, Sarah and I put together a few questions that we would like to uh, maybe open up and start creating some dialogue. Uh, it, we believe that uh, uh, this is the, the start to help promoting healing uh, in our state and to learn what we can all start doing uh, to create opportunities uh, for a better future. So I'd like to introduce first uh, the folks that are here with me today, the leaders in our communities. Uh, we've got Clarence Hill down on the end, who's the founder of Stronger Together. Uh, Clarence is a strong and, and needed voice for racial reconciliation conversations in Oklahoma. Uh, we have uh, Chief Todd Gibson, who's the chief of police at, uh, at Moore Police Department. Uh, we have Captain Marcus Williams from the Cleveland County Sheriff's Department. Thank you for being here. And we have uh, Pastor Herbert Cooper, uh, pastor of People's Church in Oklahoma City. And uh, Pastor Cooper leads a large and diverse congregation uh, in both Oklahoma City and I understand also in Indianapolis. So thank you guys so much for, for joining, us, uh, joining us today. Uh, so my first question I have for you, Pastor Cooper, um, can you share with us about your perspective of what you have seen unfold in our state and across the nation over the last week uh, with these demonstrations? Yes, uh, I just think all that's transpired really over the last week and the last several weeks, um, uh, I guess for me, has created a lot of emotion. Um, uh, I would say I've had a wide variety of emotions from, uh, you're, you're just looking at all of, the, all of the tension. I've had, you know, anger, frustration, um, hurt, um, confusion, um, so fear, <laughs> uh, so just a lot of emotions that, that I have just encountered myself. And uh, I would say that out of those emotions and me processing and, and thinking, and it's caused me to ref reflect on my own experiences. And uh, there have been times I have even be, been devalued because of my own skin color. And so just, just thinking about that, processing that, uh, even at a deeper level because what's happening in our nation right now. And um, I, I can remember my wife and I, we, as you said, we pastor a, a diverse church and um, there was a, a, a white family that started to attend our church and they came for, um, you know, two or three months or so. And um, they, they said, we love the church and we, we love the, the, the kids ministry and the teaching and preaching and the, and the worship. And um, it was, um, we, we noticed uh, two or three weeks or so in a row, we, we didn't see them in church. And my wife had a conversation with, 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 with the other wife. And she had mentioned that uh, with a very downcast face, face she said that um, we're not going to be able to continue to attend people's church. My husband is uncomfortable uh, being around this many black people. And those words, as a black man, really um, just creates hurt, uh, pain, to feel like someone doesn't want to be around me because of the color of my skin, mm. uh, that we couldn't worship together because of the color of my skin. And I think the part of being uncomfortable is what we, what we, what this is all about is we all can feel uncomfortable being around people that are different than us have a different worldview than us, different skin color than us. And I just really believe we got to press past being uncomfortable and engage in conversation because it's in conversation. And that's not always easy, but it's in conversation. Even what we're doing today, conversation then creates some relationship. Wow. And out of relationship, we get understanding. And that's what I'm hoping that all of Oklahoma in this season that we're in, that we really engage in conversation create relationship and that relationship will create understanding and we've got to do that no matter the color of our skin or our political party our social economic status we got to create conversation because without it without that understanding we start to prejudge mm -hmm. and that's called prejudice and that's where we can really end up not, with a divide instead of uniting to solve Oklahomans problems oh thank you thank you thank you Anybody have a follow-up comment? Uh, 
Okay, let I'm me go. Say, I, lo I love the comments, uh, Pastor, and, and I think that the conduit of influence is relationships. And so if we want to change anything, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your point. It's about building relationships. So thank you for saying that. Thank you. Clarence, uh, you wrote a really important op-ed this week. Uh, in it, you said, the reality of injustice and pain that many people of color have tried for years to communicate is now being heard at a greater level. I really like that. You know, what do you think has kept us from hearing this message and what can elected officials like myself do to build stronger bridges? I think that the question itself is gonna lead us right to where we need to be because um, empathy is the word. It's that ability to share in the feelings or the hurt of someone else. But it's hard to do that in our world today when a lot of times the national media drives such a politically divided conversation. So much so that in the past uh, five, six years, as these racial incidents have kind of come back up, I remember the statements in 2014, 15, and 16 was like, is this really happening in 2015? Is this really happening in 2016? And um, the, the sad part about that was for those of us who are people of color who have already shared in these stories at our dinner tables, shared in these stories at our family reunions, um, we already knew that these things were happening, but even uh, we had to mourn, we had to grieve, we had to suffer that pain amongst ourselves. The interesting thing about this George Floyd situation, it is the first time where I've seen such a massive amount of empathy come especially from the white community that formerly was saying, hey, just get over it. Mm. Hey, are you sure you're not too stuck in the past? What's the big deal? And boy, we've seen empathy. So through the past few years, I'll take you back to 2016. It was an election year and the same kind of thing happened. Uh, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, unarmed black men were killed by officers. Then uh, later, five police officers were killed in a, in a revenge act uh, for, of the Dallas police officers. It was just a horrible moment in our history. But man, it was interesting. The first two, when, when, when the first two unarmed black men died, one group population in, in America was upset and, and ready to want to make their voices heard. And another group was quiet. And then when the five police officers were killed, then the, the, the other group, they woke up and they were upset and they were being vocal about our officers. We want to get to a place where it's all seven, where we as a people together, we mourn for all seven. And so through the years, I've seen a certain group of people that have been, quote, waking up faster than others. And so I did my own little research. I can't tell you that I did a, a, a big uh, study on this, but most of the people that could understand before this George Floyd situation, there were people who had a black friend or a person of color in their lives as a friend somewhere in their history. And typically they stayed in touch, maybe even once or twice a year, but their relationship had gone to a level where if they heard a news clip, even if they saw it differently, they had the ability to say, hey, 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 Sh hey Chief Todd, tell me how you saw that situation. Like Chief Todd and I, we could do that. We could call one another and say, hey, George Floyd situation, how'd that hit you? How'd that hit you? But their relationship opened the eyes. So what we've done in the Stronger Together movement is simply set up principles and values that we believe will help drive us or, 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 or lead us into unity. And one of the big ones is this. Do, as a leader, uh, as those who lead our businesses, lead our schools, lead our universities, I always ask the leaders, do you have a personal friend who can give you eyes to see and a heart to feel that situation. Because there are some things, if, if I'm talking to a parent who's adopted a child or has taken on a drug baby, they can explain it to me all they want to and I won't feel it. But if they're my friend, I'll feel it instantly. So, good. so it's relationship that I would say for all leaders to have relationship, personal relationship with someone and then maybe a, a, a group of people who can help us serve the communities in Oklahoma together and be eyes for the people that they grew up with and that they know.
That is so good, the way you just explained that. And then um, how do we develop those relationships and those friendships? Do you, uh, do you have any specific suggestions? Because uh, sometimes,